So thank you so much. We are here today on the first All Things Avenia, and we may or may not have been inspired by an NPR show with that title, uh, but we wanted it to be informative and be engaging uh, and talk about some, some wine things and really talk about things in a little more in depth than we normally would. Um, my name is Eli Travers. I originally am from Vermont and in past life I was a musician and sang some opera but then moved to Seattle almost eight years ago and started working in restaurants and working in the wine industry. Uh, I became a sommelier and manager and just learned as much as I could about wine and then joined Avenia in 2017 as a harvest intern, which is how I got to know uh, the wines here, and then came on full time as a sales manager in 2018. So I've been with the team here on and off for the last three plus years. And uh, but the one thing I really love is wine education. Uh, so it's something part of my job is to do that with restaurants, but also to do tastings with you all with with members with with potential members, people that just want to learn more about wine. So we picked a good topic today, uh, wine barrels. It's something I feel like we all are familiar with in some fashion. Uh, we might know a little bit more than others, whether if you're if you're a, a fan of spirits that are aged in barrels and have toured spirits, you know, been to Kentucky and learned about charred barrels in the bourbon area, or if you've just um, spent time learning about barrel-aged beers. Um, obviously, barrels have been around for a long time. So I'm going to now share my screen and go through a little PowerPoint I put together. So wine barrels, yay. So wine barrels is basically the one of the earliest forms of wine technology. So, uh, and despite sort of what we know about barrels now, about oak barrels and how they can affect wine, it really was this sort of accidental relationship. Uh, barrels were just sort of around, it was what things were transported in. Um, and so it's fun to sort of look back and see how it began just as a practice a practical matter, but now we, as the more we understand it, it's just a really incredible relationship between oak barrels and wine. So going back with a little history, um, barrels have, were thought to have been invented by the Celtic people in Spain in the fifth century BC. Um, they were basically used to transport all sorts of things between oil or nails or foodstuffs or currency, and then of course all manner of beverages. Uh, for a long time, though, clay amphora, which were these sort of clay vessels that uh, were popular all over the Mediterranean Sea, uh, were used for wine primarily until about the 1st uh, to 3rd century AD. And then things switched over, barrels became the primo uh, mode of transportation, and basically remained that way all the way up until the late 19th century, early 20th century, when cardboard, plastic, and stainless steel were invented, and things got a little... Uh, cheaper, lighter for shipping, and wine was also usually kept in barrel um, to be served, and that really didn't change until after World War II, when a lot of wineries started estate bottling. Looking at France, we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about French oak in particular, um, partially because there's a lot of history there, and that's really where a lot of the what we know about oak barrels comes from the the way that the French have, have been doing it for a long time. Uh, but also that's primarily what we use here at Avenia. We only use French oak in our wines. So starting in the 16th century, uh, there was this thing called affouage, which is a term is basically a, um, a policy that allowed the population to go into communal land every year and cut down their own firewood. So at this point, wood stoves, wood fireplaces were the main source of energy. And so this is a way to make sure that people had access to that, even if they didn't own property that had trees. Uh, at the same time, trees were being cut down for maritime expansion. This is when all the European nations were sort of racing to see who could get to the New World first, and so they needed ships. Uh, and then because of this sort of this joint, um, this joint forces of of needing ships and people needing firewood, forest dwindled pretty quickly in this time so that by um, the 1600s when Jean-Baptiste Colbert, uh, which was King Louis XIV's minister, he was the Secretary of Navy, he was the Minister of Finance, Minister of State, sort of wore a lot of hats. Um, he oversaw the plantings of two really famous oak forests, the Limousin and Troncé, um, and basically as it acted as a continuous source of lumber for centuries to come. And then oh, down in Bordeaux, the Bordelais actually preferred Baltic oak or Hungarian oak. And 
you know, because they had to be different, they had to be special, so <laughs> they imported some really nice oak from other parts of Europe. Uh, but really, that sort of ended for a while in the 1800s, early 1800s, with the Napoleonic Wars, um, which forced them to sort of look locally, where, and that's when they started actually using French oak for their barrels. And then even up all the way until World War II, they had started using Baltic oak again, but then when trade basically stopped during World War II, they again turned to French oak. A little bit of a, uh, American history too, just because I'm a history nut, so I like talking about how it all fits together sometimes. Um, but winemakers in, in the US, sort of when we talk about the West Coast, originally used what they had available to them. So this was redwood, this was American oak, which is actually a different species than French oak. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, and it wasn't until, or basically um, they used all that oak for a very long time. They didn't really import French until the later in the 1900s. Uh, the second industrial revolution was huge uh, for lots of reasons, but what happened with oak forests is that they actually dwindled uh, because of the expanding cities in the Midwest and railroad expansion. The Midwest and sort of the, the middle part of the country was where the best oak forests were, uh, partly because it was sort of the, you, you went from the lush forest of the East Coast into the Great Plains area. And as soon as you got into the Great Plains and that soil got a little poorer, it, was, it wasn't super rich and good for agriculture, that poor soil is actually great for trees, for oak trees, and especially for the kind of oak trees that they need to make super tight grained uh, stays which again, we'll cover in a bit. So, you know, we're thinking Ozarks in sort of middle of the country. And this is around the same time that uh, obviously we get into the depression and some of the, the hard times from the early 1900s. So one of the big things that happened was the, obviously the FDR's New Deal and then the CCC, the, Civil, the Civilian Conservation Corps was a big part of not only planting a lot of trees to, to make sure we had more forests, um, but also they expanded and, and managed the national and state forests at the time. And this basically caused a lot of the population that were near these forests that kept cutting all these oak trees down to, to leave and to go in different places, move further west. Um, and it, so it wasn't until Hansel Vineyards in Sonoma, you know, in the 1950s that started to import French oak. Um, and then by the 1970s, Napa was was getting on the world stage. People were talking about California wines a lot more, so they actually had more money and could afford importing French oak barrels. Although there's lots of famous wineries like Ridge and Heights Cellars that stuck with American oak. So now we get into some of the, uh, the botany, which I, I realize I'm talking in front of my dad who was a botanist, so I hope I don't get any of this wrong. Um, but we're talking about Quercus. This is the, the genus of oak that contains a lot of different oak species, over 500 species of oak. Uh, but there's really only a few that matter in, um, in winemaking. French oak, which is also similar to the oak in, in Hungary, when you'll hear about Hungarian oak often. Uh, there's two main species. There's Quercus rober, which is also known as pedunculate oak or English oak, and then Quercus patrea known as Cecil Oak or Irish Oak. It's actually the national tree of Ireland. Um, those are the main French oaks. Then you have American Oak, which is a different species, like I said, Quercus alba. All three of those are white oak. So you, you, there's a lot of species you can group into one group. It, there'd be white oak. There's a whole bunch of species that are considered red oak. Red oak is a terrible um, wood to make barrels out of because it's a, it's a lot more porous. Um, they, they actually say that you can take a stave of red oak and the pores are so big you can actually blow smoke through it. So when we want to make barrels with something that's liquid tight, red oak's not going to do. So we have white oak uh, species here. And then the fourth oak that's really important, not necessarily for barrels, is Quercus suber. And that's the, orc, uh, that's the oak where we get cork from the bark. So this is all your natural corks that fit in are taken from oak bark, primarily from southern Portugal, but also in other places in Europe and Africa. As far as geography, these are the, the major forests for French oak. Um, you'll see sort of concentrated in the middle of the country. You have the Limousin and Troncé, which I mentioned before. And then Troncé is basically now expanded. There's a larger forest around it called Allier. We have Nevers, Bertrange near Burgundy, and then the Vosges near um, Alsace. There's also, you'll see some barrels labeled as Centre or just Centre. Um, and there's, there's some flexibility there because that can basically be taken from any forest around Paris or Lyon, Normandy, or sort of the greater Loire Valley. And you'll see I put next to Limousin and Trancé that 
these are mostly made up of maybe one species, either the Quercus rober or Quercus petraea. Um, we'll talk about it in a second, but that's that's traditionally or historically maybe accurate, but over time there's going to be a lot of mixing. There's not a guarantee that that's all, that's the only oak that's going to be found in that forest. There's, there's definitely all sorts of oak found in each forest. So as far, and like I said, some coopers are, um, are, I think it's really important to label by forest. So you will see some forest origin sort of specified on barrels, um, but mostly it's really not as important. The major processes that are done in the cooperage seasoning, toasting, stave thickness, a lot of those decisions will impact flavor so much more than the forest where the, the tree is grown. There's definitely producers that will argue and say it's super important and it's almost like wine where you have a microclimate and a certain soil type that grows a certain oak in a certain way that makes it totally unique um, and that's great. We, we let them have their moment because um, anything you can do to sell your barrels, go for it. Uh, but in general, it's it's not as big of a deal. Uh, ideal growing conditions, you want a cool, dry area. And again, that poor soil really helps to promote slow growth. The slower growth gives more rings, growth rings per inch, and gives it a tighter grain. And then the main difference between those two French oak, it's kind of confusing because I just put English oak and Cecil oak, but those are also considered French oak. Uh, so the English oak, the rover, thrives in low competition environment, um, so it's need, it needs more thinning um, and to limit the competition for resources, and they grow slightly faster, so they actually have a coarser grain. Those rings are a little bit wider, uh, and it's a less porous uh, oak, whereas the Cecil oak actually flourishes with competition and higher density, so you get a tighter grain because it grows a lot slowly, more slowly, uh, and it's a little more porous. And then those two can often hybridize in the wild by um, Quercus and something I can't pronounce. Ro Rosacea, ro Rosacea, ro one of those. Uh, forestry. So this is the, the management system, main management system in France is called Fouté Régulaire. Um, it's basically um, the idea of cutting down the slower growing oaks when they're young to leave only the straightest, healthiest trees. Um, and that really just encourages that upward growth, free of knots, because knots are not fun. It's harder to make staves into barrels if you have really twisty grain and, and knotted wood. So you want to get as straight of a tree as possible. And then the Office National de Forêt, um, they actually go in twice in the first 50 to 60 years of forest existence to thin the crop. Uh, and then it's not until 120 years later that they are ready to harvest and begin to cut and actually begin cutting in 15 to 20 year uh, increments. Um, so this is long term planning. I mean, when, when Colbert planted those forests, uh, he knew he wouldn't see any of that as, as lumber for his ships, but he knew that, you know, we need to start now planning for 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 much later in the future because um, that's that's what it's all about. So at uh, 120 years, they'll go in, they're looking for trunks with a 25 inch diameter uh, and at least 120 years old. The reason they go back every 15, 20 years to cut is because if they find a trunk that's 120 years old, but it hasn't quite made it to 25 inches, they'll leave it, they'll come back 15 years later and then they'll cut it down. Um, so now we get to barrel construction. So barrels are made by tonnelier or a cooper in English, or and these are at tonneliers or cooperages. Um, like I said, the straightest section near the bottom of, of the tree is segmented, so it's cut down to segmented into meter-long logs. Uh, and then, especially with French oak, we'll, we'll t again talk mainly about French, the logs are split, um, used to be split by hand, now they're split by machine, but they're split along these natural vertical sap channels called medullary rays, uh, which you'll see in this picture are perpendicular to the growth rings. And so, these medullary rays, and these are basically the channels that allow water and nutrients and minerals to, to go up into the outer parts of the tree uh, from the from the center of the tree. These are actually filled with tylose lignin, which is uh, a, a substance that hardens, sort of plugging them up um, to try to prevent leaks. But with French oak, um, there's not enough tylose lignin to, to make it super liquid tight. So they have to make sure they split right along that um, those those rays because if they didn't if they split them and crossed one of those rays there's a chance that liquid could actually seep through so this is a way to guarantee that the wood is actually 
um, liquid type. American oak, on the other hand, that Quercus alba, has a higher amount of tylose. So those, they actually, they're not even concerned that it'll leak. They can just saw them into whatever size they want um, without the fear of leaking. And that's really why American oak um, is a little more efficient. You can actually use about 50% of the log to make staves, whereas French oak, only about 20% of that wood is used for the actual stave. So one of the many reasons why French oak is more expensive than American barrels. After that, we have oak staves stacked in these huge towers called moraines, where they're just left outside for two to three years. And you'll see sort of that difference. There's sort of the darker ones in the background and then newer ones in the foreground. They, they basically just let them out um, so that they're exposed to all the elements, sun, rain, wind. And what that does is it actually helps leach some of the harshest and strongest tannins and flavors out of the wood, um, which will appear as sort of that, that black splotchy wood you can see in the back. Um, what that does, it does a lot of things. Um, first of all, the main reason to season the, the wood is to lower the moisture content. So when the logs are split originally, they'll have about 55% moisture, um, but that'll fall to about 15% after three years. Um, they can, you can request to have them seasoned longer, um, but a lot of times uh, because it costs money to keep these moraines stacked in, in, in rotation, you'll have to prepay for that to happen. So domains like DRC, if you're familiar with Burgundy, it's one of the most expensive wines in the world, one of the most famous wine, uh, wineries, the Domaine de la Romanée Conti. They actually uh, have their staves sit for four years and season extra long, but they have the money to do so. Uh, the other crucial thing that happens is microbials. So there's a lot of microorganisms, fun, fungi, that um, seep into the, the oak and actually help ch cause chemical changes to the polyphenols, which is basically a fancy word for some of those tannins uh, and compounds, those anthocyanins and, uh, or um, flavonoids. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, polyphenols, I think a thousand different polyphenols. Um, and that really helps season the oak as well and sort of have a, a more attractive um, flavor and aroma. Uh, American oak, this is where some of that difference between American and French come in. American oak is usually kiln seasoned, uh, which is a much quicker process. So instead of stacking it outside and sort of waiting two to three years, they can do it in a lot shorter time by drying it out. So they get that moisture content down to 15%, but they just do it uh, by throwing it in an oven. Um, what this does is it's, it's kind of a less elegant process. So it leaves a higher level of tannin. You don't have the benefit of those microbials that can cause some changes to make things really interesting, um, but you can produce barrels a lot quicker. So after that, you take those dirty, gritty little staves from outside, you bring them in, uh, and then they gotta be trimmed so that they can fit into an actual barrel. So the, st the staves are trimmed traditionally by uh, merondier, so the moraines translate into a merondier, who are professional stave carvers, uh, and it's pretty amazing. That's rarely done now it's always usually done by machine now but they basically have to plane them first which makes a straight stave into a curved stave so on one side they make it a hump on the other side they make it concave so that you have this sort of arch shaped plane or arch shaped stave and then they're jointed basically just mean that they are trimmed on the ends to be smaller than the middle where it bilges out um, so that they all will fit together in that barrel shape we all know and then there's also um, how thick the stave ends up being. A lot of this, especially with French oak, depends on that original split in the log, it was, which is how much did you actually get between those medullary rays. Um, but the standard sort of offerings are thin or thick. It's usually 20 millimeters to 22, milliliter, 22 millimeters for thin or 27 millimeters thick um, or 25 to 27 for the thick staves. Then after that, they have the job that I would love the most because I love jigsaw puzzles. Uh, you have barrel raisers who then take all these staves, they've already been carved, and then they get to, to fit it all together into barrel shape into this setup stand. That just looks fun. And then super important, crucial part of the process is toasting. So this actually began uh, as just as a way to bend the staves. So now that you have all these staves that are they're still curved kind of, but they're more or less still straight. And you have to bend them and secure them with hoops in order to make that barrel shape. Um, so originally they would heat them over a fire in order to do that. And sometimes they'd moisten them before bending them. But there's two main factors we gotta think about with toasting. There's temperature and time. 
this the the bending staves this sort of chart that I put out um, is just one example of what that might look like so you might um, heat them for about 20 minutes reaching a, anywhere from 120 to 180 degrees Celsius and that's light toast considered a light toasting uh, 10 more minutes and if you get up to 200 degrees Celsius that's medium toast and then another five minutes and another 25 degrees will give you a heavier toast um, now this is absolutely not set by any law or any standard <laughs> every cooperage will have their own rules their own laws um, or their own ways of doing it so you might get a medium toast somewhere which will be more similar to a light toast at a different cooperage there's and so all that really comes down to trial and error um, but it really is the toasting is a, is a signature of each cooperage which is why it's usually done by the most tenured employee so if you go in if you want to start working at a at a cooperage and learn about barrel making there's a good chance you'll probably never have to do toasting unless you outlive everyone else who's there <laughs> um and then there are you know some Coopers who will actually bend staves using steam or using hot water and then toast over a fire. We actually use a barrel that's kind of like that. So there's different ways that that can happen, but there's the most traditional way of, of toasting. And that's just a picture of sort of what it looks like. They roll them upside down over these crissettes. They're basically like a metal little uh, oven or a stove type thing that you add your your trim from, from all the wood you couldn't use for staves is what you use to, to kiln the fire. And then basically finish up. So you have barrel heads, which are also made of staves. So after everything's uh, been bent and those metal hoops have been uh, secured, you get the, the barrel heads in. Sometimes those are toasted. Actually, a lot of times they're not toasted. So you will have a toasted barrel where the staves, most of the barrel is, actually has that toast level, but the heads will still be fresh. Not fresh, they'll still be seasoned. <laughs> but uh, And then you have your metal hoops hammered into place. Um, as far as barrel sizes, there's there's a whole range of barrel sizes that are used in the wine world. But um, more or less, the thing to understand is that the smaller the size, the greater influence or the greater impact on the wine, because you have a larger oak to liquid ratio. Whereas if you have a large vat, um, it's good for that thermal insulation, but less of the liquid actually touches the oak, so you don't get as much flavor extraction. It's more just about um, transfer of oxygen. And then the main barrel sizes uh, are barrique, which you've probably heard of, but there's actually two main um, sort of kinds of barriques. There's the Bordeaux style and the Burgundy. Bordeaux is just a slightly longer um, barrel. And then the Burgundy is, is squatter. It's a little fatter. You have Hogshead, 300 liters, a Punchin, Demi Mouille. All these sizes, again, can vary based on what country you're in and what the Cooper decides. There's a lot of Punchins out there that are only 450 liters. Everyone's still with me? We're doing good? Awesome. Because now we're going to get really nerdy, and I hope you're, you're ready to go there with me. So, why use barrels? So, other than the, you know, practical part, the history, the tradition, that is just sort of what happened, what's the point? Why do we still do it? Well, barrels are great for two huge things with wine. Microoxygenation, and then its aroma and flavor uh, impact. So, with micro microoxygenation, or microx, I think is what the people in, in the know call it. Um, basically, this is when oxygen seeps through the pores in the wood very slowly over time. And it could also happen around the bung, the hole on the top of the barrel, which is how you fill barrels. Um, and then also during racking. Racking is just a fancy name for any time you move wine from one vessel to another. So this happens after fermentation or after pressing white wines. You have to rack them into a barrel after you uh, a fermentation you press them and rack them into barrels for malolactic fermentation. Um, a lot of times when you top barrels up, you'll, you'll rack them out of the barrels, rinse them out, and then rack them back into the vessel. So every time you do that, that's going to introduce a little bit of oxygen into the system. Um, the other thing oxygen does is it attacks tannin and causes them to precipitate and fall to the bottom, which, which can soften the wine. So this is why wines uh, aged in oak, especially new oak barrels, can have less aggressive tannin than they would have had if they were just um, aged in stainless steel. And a lot of the, and we'll talk about that with our wines, but we only really use new oak on our more tannic grapes. So Cabernet Sauvignon on Merlot, Cabernet Franc, a lot of those Bordeaux varieties are the grapes where that because they have such a high tannin naturally, we use oak to help soften those tannins. It also stabilizes color through a process called oxidative coupling. 
Um, anthocyanins are basically the, the compound that give wine color. It's found in grape skins. That's why we, we sort of macerate the wine on the skins for a long time during fermentation to really get that color out. But anthocyanins have a bleaching effect. If, after a while, they'll actually lose color. So when tannins uh, attach to cyanins and can sort of affect them with the addition of oxygen, it helps stabilize the color for, for the wine. And then the other thing to think about with barrels is the, the permeability, sure, it allows oxygen in, but it also allows water vapor and ethanol vapor out. So this, a lot of spirits producers will talk about angel share. I think it's a maybe a sexier term for, for spirits and bourbon, uh, but it's a similar type of thing happening here. There is going to be some evaporation um, while it's in barrel. Um, it actually, though, helps concentrate flavor compounds because those aromatic and flavor compounds are too big. So those, those molecules are too big to actually get out of those same pores. Um, but depending on the humidity in the room, it will sort of mess and de increase or decrease your alcohol levels. Um, so it's something to sort of keep an eye on. So then uh, you can also use oak to ferment. In. So we'll talk sort of the two main um, reason or main ways you use oak barrels is for actual fermentation and then for aging. So in fermentation, which is mostly done with white wine, uh, as far as least as far as using the smaller barrique size barrels, you can you can ferment red wines in some of those huge oak vats. We actually just acquired a huge oak vat that we've been we experimented with some red wine fermentation. But again, the main the tricky part there is you have all those skins and that that the cap of solids, the the pips, the skins, the stems that is just hard to manage if you have to do that inside a barrel. <laughs> so, so most red wines are, are actually fermented in stainless steel uh, or other containers. And then after they're pressed, they're put in the barrel. But with white wines, there's a lot of good reasons to ferment them in barrel. During fermentation, the oxygen, um, it actually helps that initial aerobic activity uh, where you know yeast is eating sugar to convert it into alcohol and heat and CO2, and they'll produce more rapidly if they have a little bit of oxygen to help them out. And then what it'll actually do is it'll, as the yeast eats all the sugar, it turns into lees, and that's that sticky, nasty stuff you see in that picture on top there, <laughs> is that's all the lees that have fallen to the bottom of a barrel. But what that does, it does a bunch of things, and, and lees could be a whole nother conversation. I'm, I'm not going to get too much into some of these technical stuff, some winemaking, just because I'll run out of things to talk about in other Thursdays. But um, those leaves are important. Um, the yeast actually um, can coat the inside of the barrel, which will limit the contact of that new oak with the wine. Um, and it also can absorb some of those wood extracts and changes them into less aromatic compounds. So what you have is a more subtle sort of integrated oak impression on the wine than you would say if you fermented in stainless steel and then threw it, the white wine into new oak barrels. That's where you get a lot of oak impacts. Um, but fermenting them in barrels, which is what we do with all of our white wines, we ferment them in, in oak, um, does, does things a little differently. And then the other thing the oxygen does uh, at this point is it helps precipitate tartrates. Uh, tartrates or tartrate crystals, if you've ever had a, a, a bottle of white wine or rosé and you buy it, you put it in your fridge, and then when you have it, you see there's these little crystal diamonds in the bottom of the, of the, of the bottle. Or sometimes on the other underside of the cork, you'll see some crystals. Those are tartrates. They're naturally occurring. Um, but there's ways that you, as a winery, you can get rid of them through fining or through cold stabilization. But the good thing is when you barrel ferment, you really don't have to do that. So we actually don't fine or cold stabilize our whites uh, out of Venia because there's really no need. We don't have to worry about the tartrates because they're already, already gone. So then we get to aging, or élevage, as the French like to say. Um, this is when barrels are basically filled with, with your red wine or after fermentation in the whites. Um, they start secondary fermentation, which is the malolactic process, converting malic acid, which is really aggressive acid. Think about a green apple, that really tart acid. And it transforms it into lactic acid or milk acid, which is just a smoother kind of acid, which helps uh, make wines a little more drinkable. Um, those are usually, the barrels are kept in a warmer room to help with that process and then moved into cold storage or into the cellar when that's done. Um, but this is when, you know, during élevage, the barrels are breathing. So this is the process when the wine inside starts soaking into the, into the staves, into the barrel, and it gets to interact with all the stuff in there, all the aromatic compounds and tannins and, and other things, and then it leaches back. And it basically will do that over and over again. And that's when you also have to keep an eye 
on the actual level of wine in each barrel because they'll need to be topped up uh, periodically to make sure that there's not too much oxygen interacting. So that's that back to that whole angel share. Um, oxygen is really interesting in winemaking. This is just sort of an aside. Uh, we could probably do a whole uh, really nerdy Thursday just about oxygen because oxygen is really, really great for certain parts of winemaking and really, really terrible for other parts. <laughs> you don't want to oxidize your fruit. So there's, there's lots of things. It's, it's the whole winemaking process, I think, could be summed up in just managing oxygen flow. And then sort of lastly here, we'll talk about some of the some of those flavors and aromas that you'll get from oak. So, and this is, it's actually, I didn't understand this at all um, when I first um, was studying this. So a lot of people believe that grain size, so that coarse grain or the super fine close ring grain will affect the flavor. Um, but they've actually had a lot of studies now that show there's really no correlation between the, the grain size and the amount of flavor you extract. That most likely it's, it's more about the species of wood uh, um, and then seasoning toasting levels. Those are just... Um, which I was totally like, oh yeah, coarser ground it makes sense that that probably allows so much more flavor into the into the wine, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, the main flavor and aroma compounds we're talking about is lactones, both cis lactones and trans lactones. Um, this is where you get raw oak or just sort of sawdust kind of oaky aromas, and then the trans lactones uh, is where you get more intense coconutty. Um, aromas. A lot of people will associate coconut with American oak, um, and it's not necessarily, again, because American oak has a, a coarser grain, or it's because there's literally two and a half times the amount of lactones in American oak in that species as there is in French oak. Um, and then coconut, that translactones is also the, is something that will decrease over time. So during that seasoning process, um, you'll actually get less and less of that compound. So that's why a lot of French barrels don't have coconut aroma is because a lot of those compounds have already leached out of, of the wood. Uh, vanillin is a, is a big compound and a lot of people think about vanilla, that aroma or flavor when they think about wines. Um, but the interesting thing there too is that um, it'll, it'll, inc it'll increase with toasting levels. So if you have um, that, that process, the toasting process will make that more intense actually until it's really high toast and then it could kill it off so you won't have as much vanilla. But what's interesting with white wines is that um, if it's during fermentation, the vanillin actually can be, um, what's, I'm looking for the, the page here, the vanilla can be transformed uh, into a non-aromatic alcohol, basically a vanilla alcohol. And that's so, uh, with the interaction with yeast cells and with those leaves. And so when you have um, a white wine that tastes a lot like vanilla, you actually can think it probably wasn't uh, fermented in barrels, it was probably aged in barrels because the, the leaves are gonna mess up that vanilla aroma. And then you have some of the, the harder to pronounce things, eugenol or an isoeugenol, which is your spice and sort of clove aromas, guayacol, which is where you get that really, that smoky, ashy uh, char, and then furfural, which is, is really just um, uh, the result of caramelization. So this is when the oak sugar, cellulose, gets caramelized in the toasting process, and that's where you get caramel butter, butterscotch and some almond flavor. This is a pretty cool chart just to sort of visually see all those compounds. This is from ETS Laboratories, which has um, wine labs all in every major wine growing region in the US. So think California, Oregon, and Washington. And you can send out samples and they'll basically give you, they'll measure all these different compounds and then give you a snapshot of what, what it could smell like or could taste like. So you can see this, the inner ring is sort of the, the average level of those compounds. Whereas the, the blue that sort of peaks out towards the smoke and char and the fur for all, so some of that sweet sort of caramelized flavors. This, we could guess, is probably a higher toasted barrel or wine that was in a higher toast barrel. So last thing um, to remember, barrels are basically, you know, they're made from living things. And so everything we've talked about, you know, from acorn to barrel, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of factors that can affect the way a barrel treats wine. And so there's actually, it's been really hard for scientists to agree on certain things about you know how this specific barrel from this specific forest and this stave thickness and this toast level how it'll affect a wine because we just don't know so the best way to manage a barrel program is literally just trying things out tasting a lot of samples um, 
failing sometimes and, and learning from, from failures uh, and just in gaining that experience. So, so that's sort of the, the main part, uh, the end of the, I'll stop share here, of the PowerPoint. Um, so I know that I didn't really talk, oh, thank you, my mom's clapping, thank you, that's very sweet. Um, <laughs> that's sort of the, the in a nutshell um, uh, barrel education part of this. Now, um, I was gonna sort of talk a little bit about what we do at Avenia, but I thought it would be a good time maybe to just open it up for questions. So if, if you were, if something piqued your interest and you had a question about something in particular, but specifically maybe some questions about how we at Avenia think about barrels and, and sort of how our decisions are made, now would be a time where you can unmute, uh, maybe just like say hello, if you can say your name or introduce yourself if you'd like, or you can just ask your question and then we'll we'll talk for a little bit. So if anyone has a question, um, maybe if you have your if you have your um, video on, you can even just raise your hand and then ask a question and then we can make sure that happens. Sure, what's up, Renee? I muted you on accident. Hi, I'm, I'm Renee, I'm Eli's big sister. Hi, Renee. And I would like to know, as a sommelier, yeah. when you're tasting a wine, can you discern what type of barrel and what type of toasting, or is that, you would mention you send things out to labs, is that something that is more specific to, like, scientific testing of things? Yeah, it's so great question. Um, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people who will say they can. I, I might have been like that at some point, but the more I learn about oak and the more I learn about wine and barrels, the less confident I would ever be <laughs> calling what type of oak was in was in a wine. Um, and part of that is like what we you know what we were just talking about. There's so much variability in type of wood, in how it's treated, in which cooper you're using, and, and what their their philosophy on toasting is, or their philosophy on on uh, how they're structuring their barrels that it's really hard to be confident about that there's some overarching sort of the the traditional divisions if we if, especially if we think about french oak and american oak um people will say french oak is more baking spice and maybe a little bit of vanilla whereas american oak is your coconut or dill a lot of people use dill as a aroma or flavor to to associate with american oak um the more i've learned about barrels the dill thing i think is less related to barrels. Um, a lot of people think it's, you know, when I talked about American oak staves are kiln seasoned instead of seasoned outside. Um, part of that is they're unable to leach a lot of those green tannins and greenness from the, the wood. So sometimes that green can end up in the wine as well. And that 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 could be part of the the sort of maybe dill or herbal or, or those kind of aromas in American oak. Um, the other major, at least as far as the Somme, the Somme world and the sommelier, community with tasting. Um, American oak is more um, s separated into specific wine regions or wine types. So the main thing, when I think of American oak, I think of Rioja in Spain, um, because the Spanish people in northern Spain have been used, honestly, it's pretty interesting because American, uh, they never really got on board with French oak. And part of that was because in the late 1800s when you had phylloxera and odium, odium and some really some pest and troubles in France and the rest of Europe, um, they started asking Spanish people for, or they needed Spanish wines to help boost their production. So they would actually take Spain, Spanish wines, blend it with wines from say Bordeaux or other parts of France so they had enough wine to sell. And so what that did is, is caused a relationship between the Bordeaux producers who were very much relied on barrels and they'd take the train down to Rioja and they taught them a lot about barrels. But at that point, Spain was had such great trading routes with the, the New World, with the United States, um, that they could just get a lot cheaper American oak instead of get this French oak from, from the Bordeaux, um, from the Bordelais. So they would use American oak um, to make all their barrels and they still do today. And so when I think of Rioja, a lot of those traditional producers or those those traditional styles of Rioja, uh, which are uh, the grape there is Tempranillo or other blends based with Tempranillo grape, um, they will use American oak and almost it's almost part of the style is to have a more overt American oak flavor. So you could get the coconut or dill or there's this like sweet and sourness. But again, so much of that can be related to other parts of the process or other um, 
other decisions made in, in the winery. So, so it's tricky. I don't know if that, if that answers your question, but, <laughs> but thank you for asking the first question. What else? Any other questions about? Yeah, it's over here. Oh yeah, go ahead. Are these barrels reused? That's a great question. So yeah, so um, we so we only use new oak barrels um, to to like I said, most of them go towards our Bordeaux varieties. So Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet Franc. We do use a couple of new barrels on Syrah. Um, on, but in very low quantities, it's just sort of part of the blend with mostly neutral barrel. But the neutral barrel is the key point here. So yeah, we, we will take a new barrel one year. And the great thing about it is we use neutral barrels. So barrels that have been used multiple times um, for other grapes, for Grenache, for uh, Cabernet, or for uh, Morved, for Rosé. There's lots of reasons to use neutral barrels. Um, and a neutral barrel has the benefit of the oxygen transfer because it still has those pores. You can still have oxygen seep through to do the things it does, but there's less of a flavor impact. Um, so you'll actually see a lot of wineries that will will label the percentage of new barrels, first use and second use, or, or second fill or third fill. And that means that they've they bought a new barrel maybe last year. This year they used it again. So you, you might get a little bit of that oak oakiness, the oak flavor and aroma, but not nearly as much as you would when it's new. Um, there's producers that will have rules of, you know, we'll hang on to barrels for eight years and then we'll we'll get rid of them, we'll sell them off. Um, I actually asked Chris this the other day because I wanted to know how long do we keep barrels. And he's like, honestly, if, as long as the barrel's still cleaned and working well, we'll keep it as long as we can. Um, there's always going to be some barrels cycling out. We'll sell some as they get too old and as, as they just sort of start to break down and don't work as well. But um, but that even that decision can be um, different based on on who you're working with. So, uh, yes, Pete. Okay, thank you. Uh, wonderful program, and I want to give a shout out to Allison in the tasting room. Yes. My question. Uh, Anecdotally, or a footnote to the barrel discussion, uh, any history of experimentation with other trees, other woods for uh, barrels for purposely for wine aging? Yeah, um, I actually wrote some of this down because I, I was intrigued. There is. So there's actually parts of the world that use um, different barrels. Some of the more popular is acacia. You, you, you'll find some acacia wood barrels, um, chestnut, beech, walnut. Some even use mahogany and then cherry wood too. Then actually, oh. specifically in Valpolicella. So this is in, um, you know, northeastern Italy where Amarone is, is from, that Amarone style. They actually will age their Ripasso wines in cherry wood. And what it does is it actually softens the tannins, but there's no vanillin or there's a really, really low level of vanilla. So because they don't want to, they want to avoid the vanilla flavor. So they, they decided, and they found that cherry wood actually can still control and tame those tannins without adding vanilla flavor. Um, so yeah, so the, you'll see you'll see other woods used. The other wood you'll see, and it's not necessarily, or it's not necessarily a whole barrel, but a lot of people use chestnut hoops. And now it's more decorative. Like if you ever see a barrel that has um, hoops that still have maybe a little bark on them around the edges, um, it's hmm. sort of a, a note to, or a, uh, nod to tradition when back before they had metal barrels and before they had those um what are they called barrel presses the hydraulic press which would help secure metal hoops they would use chestnut which is a lot more flexible to hold those staves together um but the other benefit of that was was sort of insect control because if you had chestnut which was a softer wood than oak if you had an insect problem they would attack the chestnut wood first before they get to the oak so you could walk through and be like uh oh, we gotta we gotta manage this because you can see some holes in the in the chestnut. Um, okay. But now that's again that's still not done as much. Now it's now if you see those chestnut hoops, it's more just uh, a mm. traditional. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. So this is a two three part question. Great. Do all French oak barrels come from France? Yes. Well, so you so, ship them over like in a container. So yeah. So good question. So. Yes, for at least French oak 
okay, maybe actually no. <laughs> the answer to the first question is no. Fre French oak, as far as those two species, the Quercus robur and the Quercus cecile, um, are, are grown in other parts of Europe. So uh, Hungarian oak, or there's a, a pretty famous area in Croatia called Slavonia, not to be confused with Slovenia, but Slavonian oak is also one of those species. So like, it's still technically a French oak in, in that the French oak species are grown in other parts. But when we talk about our French oak barrels, we'll, any French oak barrel is gonna be from wood from France. Um, I asked Chris this as well, because I know that there's a lot of coopers in the US that will import staves, and then they'll actually um, make the barrels in the US and then sh distribute them. But we actually have all of our barrels produced um, in France, and then we ship them over or completed already wrapped and completed. Why don't they just plant the trees here? So that species. Can. Yeah, they, they can. And there's different parts of the country that have um, a climate and growing conditions that where that species can grow a little better. Like uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, there's parts that are a little cooler where those species might have a, a better chance of growing. Um, but but more often than not, it's just because there's different soils, there's different, um, different areas. Most of the wood uh, is still coming from like the Virginia, Missouri, Tennessee, uh, Ozarks, you know, the, the middle of that Eastern seaboard um, style. But it'd be interesting to know, I, I know there's also, there's another a species of oak uh, from Oregon. It's actually called Oregon oak. And I think it's Quercus garyana, named after a guy named Gary, um, that is, is a much denser oak than any other oak in, in America. It's actually denser than the French oak species, but it's, um, there's not a lot of it and they're just now starting to sort of experiment with it, but it's, um, it takes a long time to dry and it's actually low in that tylose lignin, the thing that helps plug those rays. Um, so because it's low in that, even though it's an American oak, they actually have to split staves as well. So they can't saw staves and use more of the log because it's such a, um, it's it's so low in that that substance that helps keep things watertight. So that's kind of the the quick, this Oregon oak, which again, there's not a lot of it out there. There's only a few coopers who are actually working with it. Um, there's a chance that that can have some promise and, and work in slightly different ways and have more French style of, of cooperage, but but it's well, it just seems like the tree could be grown in a lot of places. It seems yeah. like it's more like champagne that they have a corner on it because it's French oak. Totally. And, and that, you know what, I'll look into it too, because I know, I know because it, can, it grows in a lot more places in Europe, um, I'm sure there's places in the, in the U.S. where it grows or where it can grow really well. And I actually right. don't know if there's people uh, experimenting with, with, at least with growing it, in a way that's intentionally done for barrel making. Because like I said, all the, the forest management system you have to have to, to go in and thin it out and have all this area and have really straight trees, you know, it takes a lot more planning than, um, than sort of finding oak and, and then doing your best. But that's, but that's great. That was my question. Awesome, thank you. Yes, Mary Margaret. Um, so I was curious about the stave thickness and does Avenia use thinner staves, thicker staves? Have you tried both and how, I know you said there's a lot of variation in how that affects the taste, but, um, but tell me about what Avenia does with that. Yeah, so we, I, it's a great question, I actually, because I didn't know the answer to that and I asked Chris on Tuesday. <laughs> he, he said we, with all the Avenia wines, we use the thicker staves, so the 27 millimeter option um, as opposed to thin. He uses some thin barrels for other projects he's doing um, for some other wines he's making, but not under the Avenia label. And the reason is basically the thinner the stave, the more oxygen can get in the, or the, because it just takes less to get through a, a thinner amount of wood. So you'll have more, it'll just affect the texture of the wine more and it'll, it'll do all the things we talked about of how oxygen affects just happens in a greater way. So the thicker the, the stave, then it just takes longer. It's a longer and slower process to get through some of the um, aging or some of those, those oxygen processes. Is, is that better suited for certain grapes and blends and you know things like that? I'm not sure because I know he does it with all of our grapes, so I'm not sure if it's um, if it's necessarily f for 
specific grapes. I'm sure there's different grape varieties that probably want more oxygen or less oxygen in barrel. Um, but I think it also is more of a house style thing. I think it's, it's he, he likes the way that those thicker staves affect the wine over a longer amount of time. And do you, do you purchase from a single provider? No, we have, we have reps from uh, a lot of different coopers. We work with, I think there's eight main coopers we work with, but we'll work with some, we'll experiment with some other uh, brands, some other coopers, but they have their own, you know, they have their own sales reps and people usually, I think it's February, March time that um, they'll have a sales rep it, in non COVID times, they would have a sales rep who would come and, and taste through with our, with Chris and, um, and sort of sell barrels that way. But, um, it's actually interesting cause I was, I was reading something about how, you know, winemakers are trying to, to be so particular and even pair barrels with the vintage, like, like, oh, you know, this barrel would be so great with this block of fruit, but spe specifically in this cooler year or this warmer year, because there's more tannins or whatever. But the reality of it, sort of the economy of, of being in a winery is you have to purchase your barrels usually in March, maybe latest June of the of the year you're in vintage. So in March or February, March, when you purchase your barrels, I mean, the flowers haven't even set on the vine yet, and you have no idea what the vintage is going to look like. So this it's just one of the decisions, you know, and we're we're in the process now of, of looking at labels for for our wines. We're going to be bottling this this spring and this summer uh, and then um, everything happens so much sooner than you think it does that a lot of times it's either just guesswork. It's going to be, oh, well, I think I think maybe this year we'll try this barrel out because I want to have a little more toast or a little more oak impact or, or you know, the sales rep um, sold me on this really cool barrel that they want to experiment with, so let's try it, you know. But it's harder and harder to, to match it with specific uh, growing conditions or other things. Well, when you're ready to lead the Forest and Cooper tour in France, sign me up. Yeah, done. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question. That was a great question. Yes, Logan. Whether you're using thin staves or thick staves or light toast or dark toast or American oak or French oak, do all barrels, are they mostly considered neutral after one year's use? Um, I've heard, I've heard different things. Usually I've heard three, three uses or by the third year it's considered neutral. Um, I think it also kind of, I think you, you're honest on me. I might depend on level of toast, um, or on, on thickness. Cause if there's a lot more oxygen or activity happening, that very, that initial use when it's new, it could be taking a lot more of those aromatic compounds or flavor compounds than it would in, if it was a lighter toast or, um, or a different species of wood or a different cooper. Um, but usually it's considered neutral um, by the third year, the third time it's filled. Does, and does anybody ever go in with uh, thicker staves and shave the inside of the barrel and retoast it to re rejuvenate the barrel? That's a great question. I, actually, I don't know. I would imagine people have done it though. It, it would make sense to me because especially it, because it turns into a, a money issue too. I mean, these barrels, a new French oak barrel will cost about a thousand dollars. It can even go up to 1500. Uh, whereas an American oak is like three to 500. And again, you know, all those differences with efficiencies and, and how fast do, um, do they, they can make them. But a lot of times if you have barrels and say you're a small winery um, and you, want uh, the experience of a new barrel again i'm sure that those people that will try to try to do that um it, it it'll be hard just just physically the, the act of like taking the rings off taking the cap off and making sure that nothing gets out of whack or bent i'm sure that i'm sure there's people that are specialized or, or figured out a way to do it but um but yeah but i, I don't know for certain though um, i'm looking in the chat here too uh because i want to make sure some people that are just chatting um, thanks for all oh, these people. Also, how long do you reuse a single barrel? We, we, I think we opened that up. Someone's drinking the 18 Arno. Oh, good. That's a good question. So someone's drinking the 18 Arno, and on the, on the bottle, it says that it's 15% new French oak. And so what does 15% new oak mean? Um, and basically that means that out of all the barrels that we had that 
that uh, Arno, which is a Syrah, it's 100% Syrah from Boucher Vineyard. Um, it means that 15% of the barrels we used were 100% new oak barrels. So I think with, with Arno, it's, we actually only use two new barrels. Um, so depending on how much of that wine we make in a given year, based on how much fruit we actually get in from Boucher, how much Syrah, um, most of it will go into neutral barrels. And so um, I'm trying to do quick math here, but say, <laughs> say there's, there's those two barrels are new and then the other, I don't know, 11, 12 are, um, are neutral. It'll be around 15. Is that, who's, who's a math whiz? I'm going to do a calcula calculator real quick. Two, is two divided by, yeah, two divided by 13. So if you have 13 barrels total and two of them are new, then that's 15% of all the wine was aged in those new barrels. So that's, that's basically what, what that means. Um, do barrels protect wine from smoke taint? That's a great question. I don't believe they do. Smoke taint, it's funny, not funny, it's terrible, but it's interesting because there's been a lot more research and a lot more um, money being put into studying smoke taint in the last year or two, just because of the, the problems we've had in California uh, and Washington and Oregon. There's been a lot of really, really hard uh, forest fires that... Is when I learned about smoke taint the first time, what I learned is that smoke taint really only affects the grape or mainly affects the grape in a, a particular period, and it's usually two weeks after veraison. So this is, think about mid-August maybe. Veraison is is the the time when grapes will turn from green and hard into red or yellow if they're white grapes when they get red and softer, and it's after they start turning soft and those skins. Um, become softer, they're more susceptible to smoke taint or to smoke, and that'll stay with the grape. Because um, there's been there's been a lot of vineyards that have been, you know, the forest fire has gotten really close to the vineyard, um, but it still doesn't, you know, actually burn vines. But even then, sometimes it, there'll be some smoke taint, but not as much as you think, because the grapes are already, the, sk the skins are thick enough that they don't um, soak up some of that smoke taint, that you can, you can almost washed off. But again, uh, there's so much, I, I remember seeing so many articles this year, this past year about smoke taint, and I did not read enough of them to speak eloquently on, on smoke taint. Uh, but I will learn and we'll do a whole, we'll do a whole all things of any about smoke taint, I promise. Um, is oak tree production a regulated business in France? If so, why? Um, that's a good question. I, I believe there's probably some regulation because the, there's that, the National Office of Forest Office that, that will go in to thin the forest every 50 or 60 years. And then they're the ones that decide that, oh, it needs to be 25 inches in diameter. Um, so I think there are some regulations or laws put in place, um, at least for the tree portion, for the forestry portion. I think there's a lot less laws though, as far as the tonnelier, the cooper. And so a lot of those decisions are sort of left to uh, whatever they wanna do. I think those are all the, the chat questions. It's five, so it's been about an hour. That's it's feeling pretty good. I thank you so much, everyone that's stayed with me. Are there any other sort of last questions about, about Avenia Oak or about anything you learned today? Hmm? Awesome. Well, then this is a good place to wrap it up. Thank you all so much. Um, this has been super fun. And thanks for joining me on the, the first one of these. The goal, I think, is to, and cheers, yep, uh, I got a cheers of water, I'm doing dry January, I'm sorry, um, but next next month, I promise, I'll have some wine, <laughs> um, but we, uh, just keep an eye on our website and Facebook and other things, as soon as we sort of debrief about today and plan out the next couple months, we'll, we'll let you know what sort of topics we're going to cover, I, I really want this to be really fun and, and engaging, too, so we might get to a place too where I ask people to share some of their own stories about wine. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to just to come together and, and not just learn about wine, but also just enjoy it with each other. Um, but we'll, we'll sort of go, we'll take things as we go each week uh, and hopefully learn a lot of things and I'll learn a lot from you guys and it'll be awesome. So, so if you wanted to unmute just to say goodbye, you can feel free to do that. So everyone can hear your beautiful voice. Uh, and then, I'll end.
I'll stop the recording and end the meeting and wish you all well. Bye. 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 Good job. Good job. Thank you so much. <laughs>